Welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is Tuesday, February 16th, 2021. Thanks for tuning in for a Grand Solar Minimum news update. Let's get started with space weather. First, our solar wind speeds coming in at 426.4 kilometers per second with a density of 9.0. Guess what? The sun is blank again. 12 days in a row now without sunspots. 29 days so far in 2021, giving us 62% of the year so far without sunspots. So we talked yesterday about the weak um, solar cycle that we are experiencing right now, and we are well, uh, well um, underway with this solar cycle 25, and we should be seeing a lot more activity than what we are experiencing right now. Our KPN to see right now is at a 2 with a 24-hour max of a 4. Our TCI is holding steady at 4.66, which is uh, pretty cold still. The record is 2.05, but uh, still, 4.66 is very, very cold. We are still seeing uh, lots of cooling in that upper atmosphere. Today's dosage rates of cosmic radiation is down just a tick to 7.2%. And the seven day change is zero right now. And we're still looking out for February 21st as our target date on this next coronal hole that will be earth facing here in the next couple of days. So we don't expect it, but it, there is a G1 storm watch uh, out there because if this does materialize into a storm or a, or a decent sized coronal hole like I think it will, then um, this could be enough for a G1 storm. So we'll keep our eyes on it. Let's go over to the grandsolarminimum.com and check out our space weather section to look at some additional stats on what's going on. Here we go. Check us out here. Go to the space weather section at grand solar at the grandsolarminimum.com and solar x-ray flux is up and down, very weak. That was, um, we had an interesting little tiny, small, tiny little flip of something from this Earth-facing active region. Now, they're not sunspots, but there was a little bit of something. And I'll zoom in and show you guys. Uh, it, hopefully, it shows up. Let's zoom in here. This is the region that had a little bit of action. It is responsible for the blip up there. There's the coronal hole that should be affecting Earth by the 21st of February. So, and just depending on the growth of this, if it continues to widen out, we could see the possibility of a minor G1. But let's take a look at the motion. I want you guys to pay attention to right in here, and you'll see that slight, slight little tiny burst from that sunspot region. And it's not really showing up very well. I don't think it's going to on the 193. Um, we saw a little bit. We saw a little bit of action right here in the center part, but there is an angstrom that shows us uh, in this region here. There was some a little bit of activity, and I think you'll be able to see it better in the 130. Five, wait, uh, I'll be able to tell you exactly what angstrom because Marion is the one that kind of caught my attention on it. So it looks like the, the 131 angstrom that uh, you can catch it on the 131 if you have J Helio viewer. Um, the 211, no, not the 211, where's my blue? The, the 335 angstrom. Uh, you can see it as well. But there was very tiny activity, nothing crazy. There's our next coronal hole that we'll be dealing with. This will not be Earth-facing. This is going to be just south. Uh, this would be more of an Earth-facing direct hit right here where my blue arrow is. So this is going to graze the southern uh, magnetic field, but we have seen effects from coronal holes like this. So that's why we are putting up the G1 watch. Uh, where's the sunspots? Good question. Uh, we're still blank. And let's go down here to take a look at the big picture. Now, 
this is updated and is a little bit brighter than what it was earlier when I checked on it. This is that bright region that I was talking about that could be a uh, sunspot, especially in the northern region. We haven't seen so much. Check this out here. A little bit of crack in the sun's corona. So expect a sudden burst of solar wind from that. If that holds up, that could cause seismic activity. This is our next corona hole that we'll be dealing with. It should give us slight geomagnetic activity. But nothing too crazy. Again, we were talking about this yesterday. We're not even really getting G1 geomagnetic storms from these corona holes. We're not getting enough behind it. So very, very weak solar conditions right now that we're dealing with. And this will continue on. Right now we're 12 days without a sunspot. Uh, I think it's safe to say that um, we could go another seven days unless we get a sudden uh, you know, burst of action from any particular region, north or south. But right now it looks pretty quiet. And uh, again, it's possible we could see maybe 20 plus days without sunspots in February heading into March. And again, guys, July will be here before you know it. March is the third month of the year. Four months down the road, we'll be at a year since Solar Cycle 25. So it'll be really interesting to watch how the rest of this year plays out until we get to July. <clears throat> and then compare the data of what happened in 2010 versus 2020, 2021. <clears throat> All right. Speaking of seismic activity, series of strong earthquakes hits off of the coast of Port Villa, Vanuatu. Now these were registered at a six. Point two happened around 0049 UTC on February 16th. That's today, 2021. The agency is reporting a depth of 6.2 miles. The EMSC is reporting the same magnitude and depth. The quake was preceded by a 4.9 earthquake. Uh, also uh, at 1034 UTC and at 1651 UTC. On February 15th, followed by a 5.4 on 122 UTC on February 16th, and then a 5.7, 5.3, 5.0 also on February 16th. So, um, lots of action out here in the Western Pacific for sure. We have this earthquake in Vanuatu. We had the 6.7 last night as we were leaving the airwaves. We thought we might have had two areas with the 6 point or higher, but they took the Tonga earthquake off in real time. So could this have anything to do with the crack in the Earth's magnetic field? Yes, it could. It seems like it does. I'll zoom in a little bit. Here at spaceweather.com, cracks in Earth's magnetic field. Minor, minor cracks are opening up in Earth's magnetic field today, February 16th. Solar wind pouring through the gaps is sparking auroras around the Arctic Circle. No geomatic storm uh, required. The solar wind speed is currently trending upward, so more lights could be in the offing tonight. But yeah, every time it seems like we get these little cracks and these quick little bursts of solar wind, it kind of pings our magnetic field. It seems to kind of rock the planet as well, whether it's volcano or earthquake. Uh, we had an eruption out in Etna as well. That's triggered a code orange, I believe, right now. Currently a code orange as far as the aviation goes. Severe snowstorm hits northern Japan. JMA warns it could become the strongest in years. That's right, folks. On Tuesday, February 16th, causing flooding and transport disruptions, the JMA warned it could be become the strongest in years. Blizzard is what they're calling it. And causing whiteout conditions through Wednesday, February 17th. Another multi-day storm. In another part of our world. So here we go. A rapid developing low pressure system is advancing westward over the Sea of Okust, bringing extremely strong winds and causing storm surge already flooded many homes in western parts of Hokkaido. Wind gust up to 101 miles per hour recorded in Cape Irimu in Hokkaido, 84 miles per hour in Sakata City, Yagamata Prefecture around 60 mile, 69 miles an hour in Akita City in Tohoku. The blizzard triggered the closure of nearly 600 schools 
a cancellation of about 70 flights and a disruption of more than 200 train services, according to the Kaido News. The JMA warned the most powerful blizzard in years and advised people to refrain from going outside as the storm may pr uh, produce whiteout conditions through Wednesday. Heavy snow, high waves, and strong winds may also cause further disruption in the northeast and areas along the coast of the Sea of Japan. Up to 24 inches of snow is forecasted in Okuruku uh, region in the northeast, while up to 20 inches is expected across Hokkaido in 24 hours to Wednesday morning. Uh, again, here we are talking about 20 plus inches in 24 hours time. And a lot of times that is either three quarters or 100% of snow totals that you would receive an entire month. In some cases, it could be a couple of months. Nonetheless, this is a dangerous storm. We're talking blizzard conditions. So you have high winds. Wind chill factor is going to be brutal with these kinds of winds off the Sea of Japan as well, the northeast. That's probably where we're going to see the worst of the winds. The snowfall, 20 inches in Hokkaido. I mean, that's, that's quite a bit of snow in 24 hours. 24 inches in Hokuriku region. That's in the northeast. So with all of that wind and 24, that's two feet of snow. I mean, look, Japan is no stranger to snow. Um, they uh, definitely, this is winter, so this is not crazy. So, um, again, another part of the world that we are experiencing multiple day storms and record cold japan yesterday we were talking about turkey europe ireland moscow multi-day event and of course here in the united states we're just about now getting halfway through where we uh we're, we're about halfway sorry about the over here. We're about halfway through this winter storm event that we're having here across Texas, Midwest, and into the Northeast. Move quite along here. Widespread disruption after heaviest snowfall in 12 years hits Greece. Heavy snowfall is called widespread disruption in many parts of Greece, including the capital, Athens. So Greece is no stranger to snow. So put that out there. Uh, but Athens, yeah, a little bit. Uh, Athens on Monday, February 15th, 2021, resulting in delayed transport, power outages, and suspended services. According to the National Meteorological Service, this was the country's fiercest snowfall in terms of intensity and volume in 12 years. Roughly right before the last minimum cycle is actually in the downtick. So... And again, let me ask you, is that a coincidence? Is that a coincidence that the last time Greece saw snow this significant, this far south, was during our last minimum? No, it's not. Four years ago, 2008, nine, one of the harshest winters, one of the coldest periods, one of the strongest parts as far as week goes for sunspot activity. That was it. 08, 09 were the years where things were at, a, at its lull in the minimum. And they're saying that this is the last time they saw snow this far south, especially of a significant nature. Absolutely gorgeous pictures. Very heavy snow, though. You can see the branches here bending downwards. Very, very heavy, thick snow, folks. Very packable as well. So that should be fun for the kids out there. Historic cold temps and snow in Wichita, Kansas. Read this. The incredibly historic winter storm continued its assault in southern Kansas on the morning of February 15th, adding another inch or more of snow during Monday. Temperatures on February 14th shattered record lows in Wichita at negative 7, beating the 1936 record of negative 4 for that particular date. The record low for February 15th was already shattered at midnight, but not officially recorded as of late Monday morning. Previous record of negative 5 and 36. So far, Wichita was at negative 8. Wind chill values of negative 30. <laughs> uh, Wichita has not been above the freezing mark in over 8 days. That's right, folks. 8 days. 
And last night we um we talked about the um state of emergency that Kansas was in. They wanted you to reduce your energy, reduce um thermostat from your normal, I don't know what people keep it at these days, 70, 72, who knows? Uh me, I'm guilty of that, I guess. Anyway, um, but they wanted you to you know, turn it down to 65 to 68. It's hard to do, especially when you're talking about temperatures in the negatives. With wind chills in negative 30, when that wind's blowing, let me tell you something, folks. Kansas, it is windy. And you folks that live out there in Nebraska and Kansas, and you know, I don't have to tell you, it's very, very windy out there. So that wind chill is brutal. Also, want to give a shout out to a good friend out in Nebraska, Matt Bros. Let me tell you something, guys. Farmers have the toughest job in the country, hands down. Uh, two calves were born last night under at Matt's uh, ranch, and he showed me a couple pictures. And you know, it was really cold last night. And to hear that, you know, farming goes on, nature goes on. These guys get up in the middle of the night, you know, to go check on these cattle. And make sure everything's okay. Two, three o'clock in the morning in these temperatures. Um, brutal conditions. But, uh, you know, you hope that everything is okay for the farmers out here across the Central Plains. And I know me and Matt were talking uh, just the other day. Uh, him and his dad were talking about crop loss. And guess what? It happened. Cold snap deep in Texas almost certainly means crop loss for citrus growers. So we were talking about oranges and grapefruit, and that's going to cut in. Of course it is. It's still freezing. Houston's low temperature today. Uh, this morning they woke up to 16 degrees. That doesn't happen in Houston, Texas, okay? Uh, that far south anywhere. But my point I'm trying to make here is that we're talking about there's so much wrong going on right now in Texas. We've got crop loss, we've got power outages, and frankly, in fact, I'm going to jump stories here because this is concerning. I saw on Twitter today a gentleman talk about, in Pennsylvania, he had frozen wind turbines. And here we are in Texas. And there is an issue as well in Texas. I can't believe I'm saying this. Frozen turbines in Texas. Now, wind turbines are not the sole contributor to the energy in Texas. In fact, it's about 13% right now, wind turbines. So, 13% wind turbines. The rest is all coal and natural gas. So last night, they lost about half of their output. I think something like 67 megawatts was normal for the gas and coal to produce. That Well, they were, they were short 30,000 last night megawatt per hour. So did the turbines cause the power outages? Mm, a little bit. Not really. They... You know, you're talking the coal and natural gas plants were the ones that had a hard time keeping up. But think about this for a minute, and I'm bringing this up for a reason. Right now, in Texas, the day after, we have, and this went up. It was This was up to around 4 million. It went down to 3.1 million. Now we're back up to 3.2 million customers without power and what are the temperatures right now super cold are we back down in the teens again absolutely so 3.2 million customers are without power tonight and this is gas and coal's fault well i mean let's face it texas doesn't have that high of a demand of gas Heat or whatever they heat use the heat down there. Not a high demand in Texas. Just doesn't get that cold. So same, you know, same with parts of Oklahoma. Doesn't get that cold usually. 
But where am I going with this? So we got an administration in right now. And they want to do the Green New Deal policies. Okay. But this is a reality. Frozen wind turbines. Oh, and what do they use? What do they use to, to clean the turbines with, folks? That's right, jet fuel. They burn it off. But, you know, they put more carbon in the atmosphere de-icing these things. Um, anyway, my point I'm trying to make here is that the Green New Deal is going to happen under this administration, unfortunately. And right now, 13% of the grid is relied upon by solar and wind. Or, I'm sorry, wind turbines. So what are we going to do on a day like today? Deep in the grand solar minimum in the 2030s, late 2020s, all the 2030s and early 2040s. This will not be the last storm like this that goes through Texas. This will not be the last time we'll see cold weather dip that far south. We may not see it for a couple of years after this year. This might be a big one. Who knows? Maybe 2022 will bring us even more cold before we start to see a little bit of sort of, sort of normalcy in the south. For 23, 24, and 25. Possibly 26. When I say normal, folks, I'm not talking about record-breaking heat. I'm not talking about the normal that we once knew. I'm just saying more average, more mild than cold during those three, four years during the maximum. But we're still going to have cold winters. You know, 2014, we had uh, a peak in the solar max. And that was also the same year that we saw... Um, a polar vortex um, cut loose in the lower 48, negative 17 for a high in some areas. And that was during a solar max, so it's not unheard of to see these cold spurts. But as we get deeper into this grand solar minimum, like this is only the beginning. Wait till we're into this full blown. This won't be happening once or twice in a year for Texas. It could be a new norm. So we're thinking about crop losses now all the way in the south because of it. I mean, this snow map is incredible. I'll show you here in a minute. 70% of the country right now has snow on it. I know some of it's ticky tack. Some of it is ticky tack. But the fact that I can say that to you guys is truth is, is crazy to me. And the idea that winter is going away, that there's not going to be any more snow, it's going to be a thing of the past. Have you guys have seen the Northern Hemisphere snow cover yet? Yeah, that's quite a bit. So let's take a look. Well, one more thing. Yeah, let's take a look here at snowfall all over the place. I said last night when we were leaving the air, this thing looked like it was trending more north, and it was. So folks like Scott Rose in Detroit you picked up close to eight inches of snow, if not more. There were parts of eight to 12 inches. But really, the areas that we thought were going to be the heaviest were a little bit uh, further south. But this did track a little farther north. And a lot of the heavier snow went through central Indiana and northwestern Ohio into southeastern Michigan. Um, a lot of us thought that this heavier band was going to be more in this region here moving through. I know New York was slated to originally 7 to 9 inches of snow, possible of 8 to 12. Uh, yesterday in their advisory update, they dropped us down to 2 to 5, and I thought, no way. Well, they saw the track it was taking, and that's why they dropped the snow totals. In fact, uh, where we are, we looked, and we only got 2 inches of snow out here. So... At the last minute, they cut the snow totals big time, but man, were they right. Uh, yeah, George says, uh, Al, 2007, your kids will never see snow again. And here we are. And we're talking about storm number two. It's already on its way right now. It's already started in Texas. In fact, before we go into the GFS outlook, let's take a look at the next three days. What is expected? Here we are today. Snow in the northeast. It looks like winter. It looks like winter. Heavy snow across Oklahoma. Freezing precipitation across Texas as well. 
as this next storm gets started. And really, <clears throat> this storm system, folks, where they're showing you the light right here, all the way down into here, that, that is literally, when you look at the live radar, we've got light snow all the way from the northwest right now as we speak, this wide. So dipping all the way down into the south as we start talking about the next storm that will make its way. This one's going to be on a more southerly track. So uh, where I am, it's not going to hit on a dead on bullseye, but we could see heavier amounts in eastern Ohio, most of Pennsylvania, southern New York, and Massachusetts, New Hampshire, into Maine. could see some heaviest of, uh, totals. It is thought that we could see some possibly uh, in the capital region of New York and further northward. I'm not so sure right now. We'll have to take it one day at a time. These have been really hard to, to forecast. Here is Wednesday. That storm approaches once again. All snow for you in Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Oklahoma, and parts of Texas. More of the frozen stuff. Heavier snow, too, along the Mississippi, up east or western and east western Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, was where the heaviest snow will fall up the Mississippi. Frozen precip again across the south with showers. Some could be severe. So almost a repeat of what we saw with this last system there. That's track of it right now. Appears to be a little bit further south. Now, according to the National Weather Service, NOAA, they believe on Thursday will be the heaviest snowfall we'll see in most central New York and north country. And then frozen precip right just below Albany. If you live in Poughkeepsie and south of New York, looks like that's where you're going to see the majority of that icing there. New Jersey, Atlantic City, parts of New York City also could see be dealing with the sleet slush mix on Thursday. And that's when things are supposed to pick up once again. As far as um, looking at how much snow we could get over the weekend. Where I'm at, they're calling for a possible of, of 8 to 12 uh, inches of snow possible here this weekend. They said that last week about this current storm uh, Tuesday, and it fell apart. So here is that outgoing storm in the northeast on Wednesday, as you guys can see across the northwest mountain region through the central plains. And in northern Texas, we are starting to see that snow. Like I said earlier, that is what is going to happen tomorrow. Uh, some lake effect snow here possible for Buffalo and the South Towns. Erie, PA, and Cleveland also. This is all going to be lake effect related. Not to this storm. Uh, we go into Wednesday. The storm really picks up some speed in the south. Moving across the south. There's that ice threat up the Mississippi. Uh, GFS has it tracking a little bit further east now with the ice and the rain line is um, not as prominent as it was earlier, but the heavier snow in Virginia, that's right, West Virginia, and heading into uh, Philadelphia as well, they could see a very heavy dose of snow. New Jersey, Atlantic City, be prepared for this one. Ohio, this one could only bring you maybe three to five inches, but still another three to five inches on top of what you guys got, close to eight for most of you out there. Heaviest snow is gonna stay along the coast this time, and I do believe widespread snow will overcome the entire northeast by Friday. Heading into Saturday, it gets lighter overnight as temperatures drop again. And that's what's kind of going to choke off that snow machine. Except if you live near Lake Erie or Lake Ontario, it does appear we'll see some lake effect snows reaching all the way across Syracuse and parts of the north country. South of Buffalo, we'll see the lake effect heading into Sunday. And then some cold air reinforces itself in the northern plain states across the great lakes and another system could bring some minor accumulation by this coming monday again three to five is not out of the question from this system now the theme of the day is that we talked about the northwest showing patterns of storm after storm well the northeast might be the next area that also shows that pattern as well Several systems move in and out. I mean, look at that. This is March 3rd. This is actually updated here. So what does this mean? What does our temperatures look like for March? What, what are you thinking so far, right? Well, I'll tell you. We're going to see this cold last through the week, get to the weekend. Here's Friday. 
and finally start to see improvements by Monday, February 22nd across the south. We'll be getting a little bit closer to normal. It's short-lived, but it helps, right? More cold for the northeast, though, not really letting go. The north, the northern uh, plain states and, of course, the Great Lakes states. And then you see more Arctic air trying to make its way back into the lower 48. Look at the south on February 24th. We start to see some normal temperatures again across Kansas, across Arkansas, uh, Missouri. Finally back to normal here. Texas, we see some 70s and 80s. And then here comes this nice big ridge and fridge starting here on the 27th of February. And why are we seeing a ridge and fridge? Is because we're seeing this Arctic blast once again from the northwest pushing all this warmth off to the east. And as we do, we see this surge of warmer temperatures up and down the east coast. Very short-lived. This thing will brush through the northeast by the end of the month, reinforcing more cold air into the northeast, the Ohio Valley, the Great Lakes. Look at that. By March 2nd, we are going to be dealing with another polar vortex blast of Arctic air. And this time, it looks like the northeast is going to be the recipients of that. It's the far northern plain states, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Actually, those are almost Great Lake states, but still uh, up in that corner there. And Michigan into the northeast. I believe that we will see the cold um, stick around for a little longer. Our friends in the Midwest and the East Coast and Central Plain states uh, will try to get back to normal. But I believe we got another shot of really cold Arctic air coming in the first week of March. And then how long it lasts, you know, I'd be surprised if it lasts anywhere close to what we've seen here across the country now. But. But um, this is a grand solar minimum. So anything is possible, and it would not surprise me to see a late start to spring. Uh, what's the proof of that? Well, let's take a look. This is the North Pole that we're looking at straight down. Here is the Arctic Circle right here. Watch this cold here how it transfers into Canada and continues to move southward as we get back into March. This is the 19th of February, moving into the 20th. Look at that. Things look like they might be trying to level out a little bit right here if you look at it like this, right? Well, here's where we burst your bubble. As this cold comes spilling down one more time, I believe this one is going to be the last of the big Arctic push. But by the 26th, we start to see colder air working its way back into the lower 48 and a big drop of some very cold Arctic air moving across Canada. Again, it's teasing us. We have plenty of cold in the Arctic to go through. I still think it's possible we could see another polar vortex blast in early March and into mid-March. And then after that, we could be seeing some signs of spring. But I think the Northeast, the Great Lakes, and the Northern Plain states are going to experience a little bit longer of a cold. And the Northwest as well. Uh, parts of the Northwest, that is. Let's take a look at our snow totals. Obviously, we didn't get what we thought we was going to get with this storm. Here's what they're thinking for the next round of snow. That's right. This goes into Monday. GFS is being really stingy with those snow totals here. By February 22nd, areas that we thought we'd see 20 inches of snow, now we're only showing about 5 to 10 inches of snow in parts of New York, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Uh, the heaviest snow looks to be in the far northern parts of Virginia and southeastern parts of West Virginia and the higher elevations as well. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Scranton will be seeing close to a foot of snow coming up here this weekend. But this storm is trekking a lot more south than the one we just had. Additional snow over the weekend, a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, by the end of this month and into March, and the March 3rd storm is what we got to watch too because there's another one coming across but look at how everything kind of fills in over here in the Northeast as we go to the end of the month. And that's because the system is being relentless over and over and over again. Now, just because we see snow here and here doesn't mean it's going to stick around <clears throat> down here. In fact, my next snow line, when we talk about this in a couple of weeks, I believe right here is our cutoff where I'm taking you with the blue area, blue arrow. I believe that's going to be our new cutoff for the rest of the winter when it comes to snowfall, this right here.
And that's classic La Nina pattern, okay? I'm not doing anything amazing. I'm just basing this off of empirical data and what normally happens during La Nina. Again, I hope I'm right because I'm sick of this cold. <laughs> and I know it's funny for me to say that because I run a channel that talks about global cooling. But this one's been different. And you can all say the same right now. We have had a pretty brutal winter here. It really kicked into gear in January. And we have seen the cooling for the past several weeks now, for at least eight to 10 weeks on the UAH, everywhere. Snowfall around the globe. Uh, we've seen lots of snowfall action. We've seen lots of cold records being broken. And yet I bet you are still gonna hear about how warm February was for parts of the globe. I just can't wait. They'll ignore all the cold records and the snow records, but you know, they'll find somewhere like Dimebox, Africa or something. And it's, you know, it, it got really hot there one day. So they'll, they'll talk about that. But anyway, guys, if you like what you, what we do, please check out our Teespring store, our YouTube channel. We got hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, stickers, you name it. You see something you like, it would go towards our channel. It'd be greatly appreciated as well. Uh, also, please like and share. And all, I want to share, actually, the um, last couple of days, I've been doing something a little different. I've asked you guys to leave comments in the comment section and give us an update on uh, the weather where you are. And we've gotten a huge response, uh, a couple of videos now. And it's amazing to see some of these, uh, you know, some of these uh, reports coming in from all over the United States. Parts of we've had people from Italy. Pipe in. We've had people from here in the United States. Um, you know, we got people commenting here. Uh, Hillsong on Valentine's Day, South Texas, 45 minutes due south of San Antonio. It's snowing, 17 degrees with a wind chill of zero. Temps are expected to bottom out at 7 a.m. at 14 degrees with a negative eight wind chill, and it's supposed to be even colder tomorrow night. Talking about Monday night, folks. We're getting some very detailed comments about the weather, and it's because people are are not not really excited, but this is something to talk about. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of historic cold happening right now. Records are being shattered, and we are approaching March 1st, and I am really going to be, um, you know, I guess I'm anticipating to see what numbers are going to come out of the UAH. I would be surprised to see us above baseline. Uh, after this month, to be frank with you. The, the kind of cold that we've seen, yes, the end of the month is going to fluctuate. It's going to help get back to a little bit normal here in the United States. But that's just across the South. And I'm just not sure those few days of minor warmth is going to make up for all those sub-zero days. And, you know, like I said, we're, we're dealing with crop loss in Texas, Oklahoma, you know, parts of Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, Kansas. we got to keep our eyes open. You know, keep prayers for farmers like Matt Bros out there who's got to work out in the negative 22 degrees in the middle of the night and help give birth to a calf. I mean, look, our farmers, folks, these guys are dedicated to their job. They can't stop. They can't call in for a snow day. The absolutely uh, incredible backbone to this country is our farmers. So if you know a farmer, thank him. Say thank you because this is not easy work. And I know when Matt shares stories with me, about some of his days, uh, I, I thank God that uh, there are humans that are built for this, and apparently Matt is. But anyway, that's my shout out to you, Matt. Thanks once again. Uh, quickly, let's take a look and see who's in the chat tonight. I know we have a lot of faces out here that are familiar, and I just want to give a quick shout out. I saw Knife Collector in here earlier. Good to see you as well as always. Uh, also, I saw Jerome, very enthusiastic uh, gardener. Hello, Arnold Schmidt. Uh, Schmitty Edward, good to see you out here, my friend Thor, as well. A pleasure, Jesse Vorward from Wisconsin. How's it going up there, eh? Uh, pretty cold, it looks like, as well. Also, want to say hello to Marie Mitchell. Nice to see you out here as well, and lots of other new faces. Richard from New Mexico, good to see you out here, brother. Summer BC, good to have everyone here at the channel tonight getting caught up on your grand solar minimum news update. Looks like we'll be back tomorrow night as well because we'll be talking about totals that will be in Texas and parts of the south as this storm moves across the Midwest and into the Northeast. There'll be plenty to report. Also, one more ask, a favor, alongside of um, 
the comment section, leaving us your temperature and all that and location. Um, also, if you're a member of us on Facebook, go to our Grand Solar Minimum private group, join in, or just go to the regular uh, Facebook page on Grand Solar Minimum, and you'll recognize our logo. And Mari is putting together a recap video, and um, if anybody has some pretty neat footage they would like to see if we can get included in that recap video, who knows? Mari has tons of footage for it, but you never know, just maybe a lucky subscriber will get their hometown featured in a Grand Solar Minimum video uh, edited and produced by none other than Mari, my wonderful producer and wife, by the way. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. Thanks for watching once again. We hope everyone is safe and warm, and we will talk soon, guys. Take care. Do you like this show? Give us a thumbs up. Want to support us more? Share to your favorite social media platform. Buy a t-shirt or become a Patreon. All links are in the description.